This discussion is being recorded by the Atlanta Forum Network and will be available online at www.atlantaforumnetwork.org. Let's take a moment and listen to this benediction. May the holy ones whose pupils we aspire to become show us the light we seek. Give us the strong aid of their compassion and their wisdom. There is a power that makes all things new. It dwells in the hearts of those who live in the eternal. There is a peace which passes all understanding. It lives and moves in those who know themselves as one. May that peace brood over us. May that power uplift us until we stand where the one initiator is invoked till we see his star shine forth. If you or someone you know would like to present a lecture, please see Brian James, and he will be happy to help you. Our guest speaker today is Brian James, and he'll be giving us a, um, a lecture on Kabbalistic Pathworking, Unveiling the Hidden Truth. Brian is a spiritual consultant, lecturer, and teacher here in the Atlantic, Atlanta area. He is a longtime student of both Theosophy and Hermetic Kabbalah. He will be discussing the use of pathworking. This practice uses the Kabbalistic tree of life, which acts as a map toward our deeper understanding. Brian will draw from his study of Hermetics, Theosophy, Kabbalah, and Jungian transpersonal psychology to help us see the ways we can learn to pull back the many veils that limit our view to our higher self and our as of yet unseen truths. Please welcome Brian James. I think that description was a little too concise. I think you just gave my whole lecture. <laughs> um, so. I want to thank you guys for coming today. And um, those of you who've um, seen me lecture before, this is going to be an extension upon what I've lectured previously in the past. We've talked about um, Kabbalah and the Tree of Life um, with the descent of um, uh, the power down the Tree of Life, what theosophists call Fohat, uh, what um, Kabbalists call Shekinah. And that power coming down is the creative force. So, um, and it comes down from Kether here to Malkuth here. Um, but today we're going to talk about the ascent. Um, um, we are the, the, the created um, entity that comes out of that creative force. And we'll be moving, uh, our, our goal is to move back to source. So that's what pathworking does. Now the history and the practice of unveiling truth through, um, through uh, uh, a fa using a fashion of uh, revelation and unveiling um, comes from Hermeticism. And it goes back to uh, roughly the 1500s with Cornelius Agrippa. Um, and I have some books up here that go through Hermeticism and Kabbalah and Cornelius Agrippa's work is in this book. So, um, however, in the 1500s, when uh, Hermeticism was using this practice, um, the Jewish Kabbalah was not yet quite adopted into Hermeticism quite yet. Um, uh, that came later. Um, so, uh, we, get, we get now to roughly the 1800s when a gentleman by the name of Eliphas Levi um, decided to uh, uh, really, on a public scale, add Kabbalah to um, to Hermetic to the Hermetic arts. Now, prior to the 1800s, I'm sure there were many places where Kabbalah was had already been added to the Hermetic arts, and it was probably being done on a personal scale with many people who were practicing. However, it was not yet widely adopted. And um, I'm sure that in Kabbalah, pathworking um, had been done through uh, in its Jewish tradition, but 
Uh, remember that in early studies of Kabbalah, uh, especially in the Jewish tradition, uh, many of the things that were um, done for personal growth um, and spiritual understanding were protected and were kept secret. So uh, we're not really sure how, uh, how much path working has um, in, their inner, in their inner sciences. Um, so describing path work, to, before we can describe path working, we have to describe where we are. Um, when we start the, um, the path, per se. And the best way to describe ourselves in this fashion is um, we, are a separate, we are in a separate state, a corporeal, individualized state um, that leaves us separate from our self, capital S, our higher self. And um, in this state, we individualize ourselves by using um, terms like I or my. Um, these, are, uh, these are words that represent our ego. And, um, you know, we use, we use them in ways like I have a body rather than I am a body. Or I want this or that. Or I cannot do this or that. And somehow, in this individualist, individualized state, we don't identify those terms as part of our whole self, again, capital S. We identify them as parts of our self. And this is the illusion that we live in, the maya that we live in, that we are separate from ourselves, that we are a viewer, that we are a driver of our vehicle. We we are not a driver of our vehicle. We are part and parcel of the whole. And that's the, that's the part where we have to, that's the part that we have to work on in path working. That's what our goal is to try to realize that we are part of this whole. Um, you know, we say things like, um, my feet, my hands, my ears, my eyes, those, those are, and we're saying those things as if all those things are separate from ourselves. And, um, if you ask most people in the West, funny, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's different in the East, but, and I'll tell you what it is in the East, but if you ask most people in the West where their individualized state is, where their soul is, where their being is, strangely, it's somewhere between the ears, right behind the eyes, in the middle of their head. That's where they see themselves as the driver of the vehicle. That's where they see the real self. Um, and that place is, um, in essence, a representation of where their ego lies. Um, in, the, in the East, it's funny, in, the, in uh, Buddhist traditions, it's the heart. And if you asked a Buddhist where their, where their soul is, they would say their heart. And I find that very interesting that they have a different definition of where they define themselves. So, um, to, uh, to speak further, I'm going to say that the, the one thing that needs to be understood about path working is that it's, uh, it's kind of like music. Um, you know, the best, the best piece of music is not, uh, is not defined by its last note. Um, we tend to set goals, and we tend to set a goal and say, okay, I have not obtained, or uh, I have not attained success until I've reached that goal. Um, and so, going back to music, you know, the, the piece of music is not defined by that last note. It, if it were, then the best conductors would be um, the conductor that conducts really fast to get to the last note, and then the last note would be ah, you know, and, and it, would be, it would be the best note. Or the best composers would be ones that compose one note. They just come up, and they sing one note, and they're done. Okay, well, that's not really what it's about. And uh, we tend, with our ego, to try to create uh, a definition of where we want to be, where we want to go, and, and define it as that, as that big goal. And... One of the reasons why I think Kabbalists um, in the Jewish tradition tended to 
uh, make a requirement of being 40 years old and, and you know, a, a successful person and so on and so forth before you could study Kabbalah is because I think by the time you hit 40 and by the time you've reached what, you're, what you think your pinnacle of success is, you have tried to uh, attain fulfillment through all these corporeal things. Uh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to become the CEO of a company, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to school, and I'm going to go to first grade, second grade, third grade, high school, and then I'm going to go to college, and then I'm going to get my doctorate, and then I'm going to go to a company, and then I, I'm going to climb the ladder, and then you get to that office, and you open the door, and it's an empty office. And you're like, hmm, this really didn't fulfill me. This really wasn't what I wanted. Um, and so uh, one of the reasons why they, I think that they set those requirements is because I think that in the physical world, we've reached a state at that point where we realize I haven't reached my fulfillment. I haven't seen my fulfillment from all these external things that, that represent who we, uh, that we think represent who we are. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, the best part, the, the thing that we need to learn going back to that music is that um, the, the path that we're on is the actual work. It, it, that we need to set small goals that a piece, just like a piece of music um, comes to a crescendo and it sends us to places of ecstasy and, and, and epiphany and then it, there's lulls in the music where we become introspective and we become anticipatory of the next note. Um, you know, those, um, those are the exact ways that we should treat pathworking because um, pathworking should not be about the goal, it should be about the journey itself. We should be dancing and singing along that journey. And so that's what, um, that's the best description I can give of what we are supposed to be doing uh, with pathworking. If we bring ego back into it, then we get people, and believe me, even the greatest of minds in Kabbalistic and Hermetic pathworking have done this. We get people that, go, have, that create situations like, I've gotten to this sephra, how about you? Or I've crossed, the, I've crossed this abyss, how about you? you know? And that brings ego back into it. And they might as well repeat the work that they've done because they obviously haven't learned what they need to learn. So, um, the, the word Kabbalah means to receive. And um, the question is, what are we receiving? What are we looking to receive? Um, we're looking to receive the realization of our true self, our monadic self. Um, in Kabbalah, it's referred to as the Adam Kedmon. Now, the Adam Kedmon is our primal self, but it's also the, 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 the true self that we, tend, that we have separated ourselves from, that, that space behind the eyes, between the ears. Um, where we are a driver, that's the part that's been separated from this, this true self. And the goal here is through our ego, and I know uh, a lot of Buddhists would be like, oh my gosh, you're using the ego? But you are. You're using the ego because um, through that ego, you are trying to come to a realization of what fulfills you. Um, you know, and it's part of the spiritual path to use the ego. It's part of the spiritual path to, to buy that brand new car and try to see if it fulfills you. And then when it doesn't, you go on to the next thing. And what happens is over time, you get to a point where you seek higher and higher and truer and truer and more beautiful things to try and fulfill you. And eventually, you, you will get to a more spiritual understanding that the that the things that are um, that are that you perceive of as outside of yourself are those things that are going to fulfill you and and you, through that you also learn that those things that you perceive of outside of yourself and we're talking about spiritual things outside of yourself um, that you perceive of that are separate from you aren't really separate from you at all. One of the reasons I entitled this lecture "Unveiling the Truth." 
and I use this um, analogy quite often, is that the best way to describe how we, how we learn about ourselves is we are in a room, and in that room is several pieces of furniture, but between the pieces of furniture are veils, a curtain, if you will. And we're in, a, we're in an empty space, a dark space, and then we unveil one of those curtains, and all of a sudden the room becomes a little bit lighter, and we see another piece of furniture. And then we unveil another curtain, and we see another piece of furniture, and the room becomes a little bit lighter. And then we unveil another one, and so on and so forth, until we reach a space where we, we now see the whole room for what it is. We were always in the room. The, 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 room, the room was always there. It was just blocked from our view, and it was not able to be seen. Um, and those curtains were blocking out the light. And um, so, so that's um, why I refer to this lecture as unveiling the truth. Now, we're going to get into a little bit of some of the mechanics of path working. And first and foremost, um, the best way to start is to go over the tree of life itself. And I'm going to, I'm going to start with, we're going to start, we're going to start at the top, but again, we'll start at the top to name them and then we'll start back up the tree, which is exactly how um, we'll be doing the path working. So this is Kether. And then we have Chachma. And then we have Bina. And then from the aunt, now we won't talk about this too in depthly, but I'll, I'll get into a little bit. We get into this, the Sephira that's not really a Sephira at all. And I'll explain that in a little bit, but this is called the ot. And then from the ot we have chesed. And then gebura. And then from gebura we have teferet. And then from Tefereth we have Hod. And then from Hod we have Yasud. Oop, I skipped one. Where did I skip one? Oh, sorry, this is an insight. Now we have Hod and Yasud. And then we have Malkus. All right. Try to read my writing, but all right. So the the tree of life is a picture, is a map of us. It's a map of our body. It's a map of the the idealized body of man, or Adam Kedmon. Um, in Kabbalah. Uh, it is a representation of the human monad. Now, it is not representation of the higher monad, which you'll hear Blavatsky talk about. That higher monad is left to the um, top three. This is um, these top three are the Atma Buddhi Manas in Kabbalah or in in Theosophy, um, and then you, you get below that. And you get to the um, seven, seven, cons the, uh, seven states of constitution of man. Okay, so we've got seven and we've got ten. And it's divided by the, what's known as the abyss, or da'at. And again, we'll get into da'at and what that means and how it functions and why it's there. Um, 
So, um, Cather is the crown. Um, it literally uh, is a representation of light. Um, uh, the best way I can describe Kether and this and this upper triad um, in science, um, I'm sure you've all seen the prism uh, experiment where light passes through a prism and it's split up into a spectrum. Well, this triangle, for all intensive purposes, is a prism which refracts the this higher light. It splits up that higher light. And it splits it up into seven aspects, seven colors. Seven colors which are uh, which we refer to in Kabbalah as well as the seven bodies and, and th those seven bodies have representation of the seven rays or the seven colors. And so these lower aspects here are, um, are part of that se the seven rays. So they function just the same way. Um, so when this light comes down and it, and it lands in Malkuth, it lands at the base or the foundation of everything. This uh, we're going from the most highest states, the most um, the most uh, unmanifested states, the 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 um, most spiritual states to the most corporeal and the most individualized states as we come down the tree. Now, of course, our goal as people who are individualized and corporeal is that we must return back to our source. And the very light that we speak of um, in, uh, Kabbalah, in Kabbalah called this, this light has a feminine representation with Shekinah. And in Kabbalah, or in uh, Theosophy, we refer to it as the Fohat. Um, that energy comes, uh, there is a point in the creation story that we've talked about before called Tzimtzum, T-Z-I-M, T-Z-U-M, where God restricts himself and in the, the space is created. And then from that space and from that restriction, um, this light flows down this tree of life to the to Malkuth. And um, so, so that's a little bit on, on the creation of the tree and why and what its function is. Now we're gonna go we're gonna start heading back up the tree. And um, in path working we set s small goals. Remember that uh, we don't want to set large goals because Large goals can tend to um, represent um, represent something that is part of our lower ego. Um, I mean, we eventually will reach the state, but remember that the path is the journey. The journey is the path, and so on. So, um, so when we set these small goals, that's when I was telling you previously where we we have certain crescendos in the music, certain lulls in the music, and we have to pay attention to those because we learn from those. We, we get a whole, a sense of the whole piece of music from those little itty bitty small sections of music. And the same is true with the little small, the small goals that we create. Um, so starting from Malkuth, which again uh, is foundation, um, this is, a, this is a state that is very not in touch with its spiritual self. Um, in, uh, in Kabbalah, and I'm going to use some terms which kind of cross over from Kabbalah to theosophy so that some, so that some of the theosophists in the room will get this. Um, these, the, the, lower, the lower portion is called the gulf. In Kabbalah, um, and the Goth is is representation of the um, stula serira or the physical body. Okay, so and the Goth is is it has it has no 
um, higher understanding. There's, uh, there's two aspects of higher understanding in Kabbalah. One is called Nefesh, and the other one is called Ruach. Okay? And um, Nefesh is um, the animation of that body, and then the Ruach is, um, for all intents and purposes, the Ruach is that ego that we spoke of. But the um, Ruach can be, um, can be very thick. You can have a, a, a Ruach that's very thick and corporeal. Or if you've reached certain states in your ego where you have reached those higher understandings that maybe to get to the higher source, you have to think more uh, flighty or, or, not flighty, that's not a good word, he heightened thoughts, um, that, um, you know, your, your, your ruach will be a little bit more lighter, and, and with the nefesh and the ruach both together, um, you can uh, form um, merkaba. Now, merkaba is the vehicle by which you travel up that, up that tree of life. Um, and um, Merkaba is, um, is basically, uh, it's how path working, path working functions so that you can move around on the tree of life. And um, you do that through, th through practice like meditation and um, outer body experiences even. Um, the best way I can explain certain certain things that happen while you're in path working, um, and you will create small goals and work your way back up the tree of life. Now it doesn't require all the time that you work your way at, back up exactly. Um, uh, in certain exercises that you have to work exactly the way that the energy came down. We there is an exercise called the middle pillar which you travel up the middle pillar, but you can move around on the tree of life um, based on what, what you're trying to achieve, what goals you're trying to achieve. And middle pillar is, um, exercise is very much like kundalini meditation. It, uh, just like the energy traveling up the, the chakra system, uh, the middle pillar is very much uh, attuned with that, that same chakra system. So, um, I'm going to give you some, some correspondence so that you can kind of understand a little bit about the, what the Kabbalists refer as the seven constitu seven-fold constitution of man. And um, in, uh, in theosophy, we talk about the physical body. Um, in Kabbalah, it's called the gulf, as I said before. Uh, the life or the vital principle, the prana, is called the nefesh. The astral body is called the tselem. The uh, kama rupa, or the seat of passion, desire, the the and 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 it can uh, it can be lower desires or higher desires is that ruach, which I'd spoken of before. Now that's. Uh, that's the representation of the, of the four aspects of the lower and how it splits it up into four is, is splits it here so you have one, splits it here so you have two, here three, and here four. So one, two, three, four. Now these lower four um, are, rep are, are referred to as the long face. Um, in, there's two faces in Kabbalah, and it's referred to as the long face. Um, and then you have the, uh, then you cross this abyss. Now, the best, the best way I can describe the abyss is um, in Buddhism, there's something called Song Chen. Um, uh, Who's a Buddhist in this room? Am I pronouncing that right? Um, huh? Al. Al. 
So, well, Thong Cheng basically is, uh, basically the, the best way to describe it, it's a reset button. Um, and when you cross from this lower corporeal states to this higher states, Al, is, am I pronouncing that right, Thong Chen? I'm not sure either. Okay. So, um, I believe it's D-Z-O-N-G-C-H-E-N, Thong Chen. Um, so, it's a, basically a, it's basically a reset. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. D-Z-O-N-G-C-H-E-N, Thong Chen. So um, it's a reset button, and you once you cross this, once you cross into this abyss, you are base, you come into this place of, of it's very dark, and you're like, wow, is this a cosmic joke? I mean, is this really where I'm supposed to be? Um, and uh, really, what's happening is you're returning to the state that unifies everything, which is pure potential. Well, if you have pure potential then you reach, you kind of go into this place of nothingness because nothing is, it is in the becoming. So if it's in the becoming and it is not as of yet, then you, you're in a place of darkness. Um, however, past the revela revelation of this um, understanding of the, of the thing that unifies every, everything, um, you come into this place of pure light. And descriptive words can't really, I can't really, I couldn't really describe it. I don't know how to describe it other than um, home, love, um, place you were supposed to be, you were always supposed to be, you were always, that was what you were meant to be, uh, a place of total recognition, a place of total understanding. And it, it was funny is, is, Hachman and Bana understanding are, are represented by understanding and knowledge. So, you know, and when you, when you get past the abyss, you go, I know this place. I understand this. This is, I understand this. Why, why do I understand this? This is, wow, this is really a deep understanding. I don't understand how I understand it or why I know it or why I feel that way, but I do. And... Um, I would say most people who do path working um, um, may not get up here in this lifetime. And there are some people who do path working who spend years trying to get up to this place. And some people who only get small, little, itty bitty, teeny weeny glimpses for just a second. And um, so don't expect that you will travel all the way up the tree. Um, and then there are, remember, there's a microcosmic tree and there's a macrocosmic tree. There's the big path working that we do throughout our whole entire life times and our life. And then there's, there's, macro, there's microcosmic path working, which is setting, small, setting those small goals, setting those, um, using the tree of life as a way to, um, I, I, bet, I liken it to Gershchev's, Gershchev Enneagram work. This is an Enneagram. Um, for all intents and purposes, it functions exactly the same way as Gertrude's Enneagram. Um, so, and, and in Jungian psychology, you can, you can use transpersonal and Jungian psycholo psychological principles with this. Why? Because um, uh, all the paths and the sephirot, um, they number 32, and there are 32 representations of yourself. Um, uh, in Jungian ideology, these archetypes of yourself are, are things that you work through, that you um, transform these archetypes, you transform the relations between the archetypes so that you can heal certain aspects of yourself. And so these can be, these can be those representations of those archetypes as well. So, how are we doing? So, um, you know, there's a there's a lot in path working that I, I could spend a whole entire uh, nine part class doing, which I will be soon. A little plug there. Uh, 
crown. Yeah, yeah. Okay, crown. So we've, then we've got uh, understanding. Right and knowledge. And then uh, you're going to have you're going to test my knowledge here on Gabura. Uh, use my notes. So we have Kether and Hachma and Gabura. The Sophist Sephiro is um, can be represented by either power or strength. I like the word strength rather than power. I think uh, power can have some connotations with the ego. Um, dot has no has no real word to represent other than the abyss. Now we hear that word abyss and we go, "Ooh, that just sounds really creepy." Um, but um, it's sort of a gatekeeper. It's sort of, if you're not ready, you're not going to cross. And I really can't even say that you cross, because you don't, you, you don't really cross. You toggle over it. You, it's kind of like double-clicking a mouse. And um, are you brave enough? Are you ready to double-click that mouse? Are you sure what's going to happen when you double-click that mouse? And then when you double-click that mouse, you end, up with a really, you end up with this black screen, and you go, is this what I was supposed to get? Um, so, and when you double click that mouse, you don't, you don't, you know, you don't, um, the computer doesn't send you hurling into the next screen. It just opens that next screen and you're all of a sudden you're there. So, when you cross this abyss, you don't really cross. You don't really, it's not like a leap of faith in, in an essence where you just, you know, you're going to put your foot out like in the, in uh, one of the, one of those uh, movies, I can't remember, uh, Indiana Jones, where he puts his foot out and he ends, up, he ends up finally seeing this little path that he didn't see before. Well, it's not really how it works. You put your foot out, and then all of a sudden you're like, hold it, I'm on the other side. How did that happen? You know? And so that's, and that only happens if you've, you've heightened that, those, e those ego states. You've gotten from that lower ego, that more corporeal, uh, rough ego to this higher to these higher understandings. So then uh, we get to um, Hased and uh, or did I, I didn't put one for Hased, did I? Which is uh, let's see. I don't see one for Hased. I didn't write one down here. You wouldn't happen to know it, would you? For Hased? Um, pretty much Hased is where you enter the abyss, so, so coming up the tree. So um, the best way I can describe Hased would be uh, energy or vivified energy. And then we get to Tefereth, which I know that one. That one's beauty. Okay. And victory is Netzek. And glory is Hod. And Yasad is uh, is foundation. And then the kingdom of that foundation is Malkuth. Now you can spend your whole entire life living in the kingdom of foundation and the kingdom of this corporeal of these corporeal states and never leave Malkuth, and many people do. Um, 
there is sort of a, a veil here between, uh, between Malkuth, Yassad, and uh, Tefereth, right in this area. Yassad happens to be where it's at. That's, that's the gate where you move into the spiritual journey. You are not on the spiritual journey when you are in Malkuth. You are total, you, that, to, that separate self, that, that, real, that, that maya, that total illusion where you are separate from your higher self, that exists in Malkuth. When you realize that you are maybe something higher than yourself is when you move out of Malkuth. So, um, so I'm going to leave that there and just say that if uh, you want to learn more, um, I will be doing a class um, on Kabbalah, Kabbalistic pathworking and um, it goes into it a little bit more in-depthly. But I touched on the functions, on why it works, how it works, and, um, and what your goal is supposed to be when you do pathworking. And I think that it is truly in a line with how theosophy functions, what our goal of the arc of descent and the arc of ascent in the, uh, you know, the, the, the theory of Manvantara, the chains, the globes, they, all, they, they are basically this tree of life. It's just organized a little bit differently, but, the, but it's ev everything functions pretty much the same way. So with that, I will end, and then we'll come back for some questions here in just a moment. Some good questions, huh? Go ahead. Can you give an example of something like that to really distinguish between very small goals and big goals? What kind of goals you have in You name it, you can you can do it. I mean it uh, I mean the You can tap into certain aspects of your inner powers through the, un through the rev revelation and unveiling of certain aspects of the tree of life, and it would leave you more capable of attracting that force in your life. Now, um, depending on how powerful you were pers with your personal understanding of your personal self and your personal powers and your inner forces depends on how successful that would be. Um, so, you know, but yes, you can make small goals like that and do some, do certain uh, aspects of Kabbalistic meditation. Um, uh, Israel Regardi, um in the uh, Garden of the Pomegranates book has some wonderful uh, meditations, sephiric meditations, um, which can help you with those as those smaller goals and you know the big goals that we're talking about is the biggest goal of all really which is spiritual understanding of yourself who are you why are you here what are you doing here what are you supposed to get out of life what and you know I mean we define ourselves by our jobs for example you're asking about a job you know uh, we define ourselves by our job so uh, am I supposed to be defining myself by that am I supposed to be defining myself by something higher um, you know so those those are the bigger macrocosmic goals that I referred to uh-huh go ahead Uh, um, yeah, so she asked basically what are some of the first issues that someone who's working on the path might have to deal with. Um, well, I think it's understanding the rules of how, of how things function in, um, outside of our illusion, our illusory state. I mean, really, uh, th one of the first issues, depending on where you are, I mean, if you're, a the if you're a theosophist, I think you already realize that we are living in an illusion. There are some people who don't, who are materialists, and by materialists, they, re 
they represent the world that they live in is the world that they live in and it's how it, everything functions. So that's going to be a big hurdle for that person. They're going to have to first realize I am, I am, you know, everything that I see here, everything that I'm, you know, that's in front of my eyes is nothing more than a big movie screen, you know. Um, the way to, the way that they can, uh, she asked basically has how, how we can, how one can realize that those states are illusion. Um, it's a process of, um, explaining and understanding, realizing, um, uh, symbols and archetypes, understanding that in, when they start to study the rules of how Kabbalah functions, um, that something that is in the same space is, um, is actually the same thing. That something that if two things are in the same space and they are the same thing, then they are actually the same thing. Um, and so, so you are not, and, and, by, and by that, it is not separate from itself. It is itself. Other than, a, other than learning that, other than uh, having experiences of epiphany and, um, and through, medita through a meditative process, breaking down the, the barriers of that illusion through, through that meditation and getting into that space of the nothingness between, um, that's really the best way they're going to do it, is through meditation, um, through exercise, through the practice of through the practice of their own magic and their own power, um, um, they realize that they can um, they can manipulate their self, they can manipulate the things around them. That they have the power to manifest, and then that they realize that they start to see that they have the they realize that they have the power to manifest things. Then they start to go, well, how did I do that? The, because that breaks through every rule that I've ever been told. I'm separate from myself, so how can I manifest things from my higher self if I'm so separate from myself? So, if I've manifested, that must mean I'm not. That must mean I'm not as separate from myself as I thought I was. So, as far as the path work goes, then the person sits down with a counselor, relationship, self understanding, or they not? Um, no, they're given exercises to do. And then they do them on a personal basis. And there are aspects and there are ways that someone who, do, who is a pathworking consult, consultant can basically see if the work has been done because certain results will tend, especially in the lower, in the lower aspects, the, the certain results will come from it. And they will have certain epiphanies and certain realizations that are typical amongst most. Um, and there'll be variations in it. I mean, don't get me wrong. They'll have they'll 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 apply those epiphanies to certain personal aspects in their life, and there will be different results for different people because everybody is different. And everybody has their own personal issues that they're working through. But the epiphany itself that they but that that they turned around and applied will typically be the same and have some of the same functions. Go ahead. Um, yeah, that's uh, a really good question, and he basically said, how, how has the work with the Tree of Life benefited me? Um, with, each, with, with each opening of, of a veil, with each passing through certain sephiro, um, it tends to open up cer certain karmic aspects of, of the self. You tend to pay off a lot of things. And I've had a lot of things happen in my life that I've learned from, um, that, that I've, by, by first realizing that, that that karma is coming from a, uh, a way to, to, to burn it off, per se. Um, I've learned from those events. And... Um, what have I learned? I've learned that I am not my body. Um, I wish I could learn that more. 
because if I learned that I was not my body, maybe I'd be able to quickly manipulate it. And then I'd be thin and beautiful. Um, but, but that's all ego. That's, you know, I, I, you know the, the, this representation of, of, of me being worried about this is all part of my ego. I don't have to worry about it. It will eventually take care of itself. Um, but, um, you know, the other things I've learned is that uh, uh, we're all unified. We're all one. We are all part of the same source. We are not several million, billion entities um, all on this planet. We're one big unified um, being, and we just appear in, uh, in, this, in this world. The best way I can describe this is as how we appear this way is um, if you had a big blob um, that, or actually, no, it, wasn't, it, it isn't a big blob. It's, it's a blob of potential. We'll just call it a blob of potential. And it's in this higher state above the ot in the, in the upper triad. Um, the, it, it is still one thing. It is one. Actually, I'll just put one. Okay. Now, why does it appear to us that we are not one? Well, what happens to this big blob, and I'll erase this particular line here. What happens to this big blob is at some point it crosses this line of delineation where things are unmanifested and things become manifested. And it goes whoop, 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 like that. Okay, now, up here it's still one. It's still one blob. Below this line of delineation it appears like it's one, two, three, four, five, six people. But it's not. Not really. Because if each one of these people started returning back to their source, then we return back to a state of one. So that's one of the things that I've learned, is that in that way we're, we are all the same entity. Uh, starting September 22nd, every Tuesday, uh, going on for nine weeks. Um, first part of the class is the foundations of Kabbalah, and the, that'll be for three classes. Second part of the class will be functions of the tree of life. That'll be for three classes. And then the, the third part of the class is practical path working. Um, and I do that because, again, for uh, we have a lot of people who may not understand the foundations of Kabbalah and how and how uh, and why everything is the way that it is, and we may have people who don't understand how the tree functions on an ascent and descent, or descent and ascent. Um, so, um, you know, they need to know those rules first so that they can understand um, how they're going to use the map. Um, It'll be, no, it won't be here. It will be at uh, Meditating Mantis in Roswell. It's a new metaphysical shop that opened in downtown Roswell. And there's flyers of it on the back. Uh, fly, flyers for it on the, in the back, so. Any other questions? Now you told me you were going to have some real hard questions for me today. <laughs> Come on now. All right. Okay, go ahead. Will you say more about this idea of cleansing or the contraction? Mm hmm Yeah, Tim Tum Yeah, Tim Uh Okay. In the creation story on Kabbalah, which functions exactly like how it functions in in uh, Blavatsky's uh, Cosmogenesis, um, you have um, a state of, of pure potential and there is nothing there. And then at some point, a point, a center of that, 
and I, so I can't describe I can't describe pure potential because pure, pure potential is that place that nothingness that I described that abyss. It's that it's that nothingness. So there's really no way to describe it, no way to draw it, no way to represent it. Because if I represent it, then it loses its nothingness. It's become something. So, but there 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 then is a point, and it's not really even a dot. It's just a minuscule point, okay, that uh, happens in the center. And then from that center uh, point, um, um, a space is created, okay. And in the center of that space, there is a constriction. The constriction, I, the best way I can describe this would be, it would look kind of like um, a a donut, so that constriction happens, and if you were to draw this in three dimensional, it would look like a Krispy Kreme, you know. So, um, and that looks really good. Um, <laughs> so, um, but uh, so so in that space, that that restriction is called symptom. In that space, in the center of this space opens up another space, and it's um, viscopisis. If you were to draw that donut in a, in a cross section, you would have that. But if those two, four, if those two, okay, if those two circles uh, merged, they came together, you would have two circles and that viscopisis. That space is where this exists. And this, in that space, I drew that line. That's called axis mundi. So, that's your answer? All right. All right, well, it looks like we're done.